Warning, I'm about to rant. If you would like a calm, cool, and collected video on MS education, maybe you should watch uh, last week's video or check out my next Monday morning video. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about one of the leading causes that lead to people impacted by MS losing work and developing disability, and doctors oftentimes ignore it. It drives me nuts, and we're gonna talk about it in this video, so don't turn away. All of that starts right now. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. In this video, I want to tackle one of the leading causes of disability and one of the leading causes of loss of work amongst people impacted by MS. And it might not be what you think. It's a phenomenon that doctors oftentimes ignore, and in fact, many docs aren't even familiar with it. But I want to bring light to it today, and I want to discuss it with you. What am I talking about? Therapeutic inertia. If you have heard of therapeutic inertia, you're in the minority. And if this is the first time you're hearing the term, thank you for tuning in. I want to discuss with you therapeutic inertia, how it impacts people with MS, and most importantly, how we can resolve it and make it better. Let's jump in. So the term therapeutic inertia was coined in the 1980s in the cardiovascular literature. A patient would present to a cardiac clinic with high blood pressure. They would be started on a blood pressure medicine. And then in follow-up, they still had high blood pressure, and yet no change was made to the medicines. That's therapeutic inertia. When you identify a clinical need to make a change, and yet you don't make a change. Now, therapeutic inertia is rampant in multiple sclerosis. I literally feel like it's the leading cause of disability and one of the leading causes of loss of work of people impacted by MS. And in this video, I want to really dig in and discuss the different actors in therapeutic inertia, how we can identify each of them, and then what we can do to turn it around and rid the world of therapeutic inertia. What are some examples of therapeutic inertia in MS? One example is identifying that someone is having an MS attack and then choosing not to treat them with steroids. Another example would be someone's on an MS disease modifying therapy, which is intended to prevent attacks, and yet they have an attack and we don't change the drug. So they remain on that same DMT that failed them. Similarly, if you're on a disease modifying therapy and you have new lesions on your brain or spinal cord, despite taking that therapy, to me, that means the same thing. And so identifying that and yet not making a change is yet another example of therapeutic inertia. A fourth example would be identifying a chronic symptom that is destroying the quality of your life, whether that be depression or pain or bladder dysfunction, what have you, and then not treating that even though we identify it's a problem. The point is, there's a lot of opportunities for therapeutic inertia in MS. Blech. Who are the participants in therapeutic inertia? There are three, and the first are patients. Now listen, I am not here to disparage people impacted by MS, on the contrary. But I'm being honest with you that sometimes people impacted by MS are not completely forthcoming in what's going on. I'll give you a couple examples. Someone who struggled to get their MS disease modifying therapy finally paid for is less likely to fess up that the drug's not working because they're going to be taken off the drug and now they're going to have to try to pay for a different one. Someone who received steroids last year for an attack and gained 30 pounds and never got it off might be less likely to be forthcoming with a new attack. I have had patients tell me, I don't want to tell you that I'm doing poorly because I don't want you to think I'm a bad patient, which actually hurts my heart. My point here is there are reasonable reasons why someone impacted by MS might not be completely forthcoming with their doctor. And the problem with that is that if we're not made aware of the problem, then we don't know it's time to intervene. Now, people impacted by MS are not remotely the worst actors at all, but I wouldn't be doing the topic justice if I didn't bring that up. And so if you are someone impacted by MS and you find yourself participating in therapeutic inertia, I want you to identify it as such and I want you to address it head on. Real quick before we move on, would you do me a big favor? If you like this video, would you please give it a thumbs up? Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Those two actions are completely free and they help teach the YouTube algorithm that you really like this content and help push it out so more people impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. 
The second group of people that participate in therapeutic inertia is actually the healthcare system where I practice medicine. So I'm an American neurologist practicing here in the United States of America, and third-party payers or insurance companies are intimately involved in the delivery of healthcare here in the US. Now, a third-party payer will mandate what we call a step edit, where you are required by the third-party payer to start on a lower efficacy drug that might not work very well, and you are required to demonstrate failure. In other words, you're required to prove that you have irreversible brain damage before they allow you to escalate to a drug that works better. Now, that is a strong example of systemic therapeutic inertia and insanely frustrating, and we don't take it laying down. My team at the Boster Center for MS writes a lot of letters of appeal, and I get on the phone very often and do peer-to-peers trying to help the insurance company understand that they need to move past their silly step edit. And yet, patients are not the worst actors in therapeutic inertia. And I don't even think that the systemic step edits are the worst actors in therapeutic inertia. It's my opinion that the very worst actors participating in therapeutic inertia are me, doctors, clinicians. There are a tremendous amount of pressures on doctors to see patients quickly, to complete all of the forms. I mean, it's, it's really a grind trying to get through the clinic day sometimes. And I may look at my schedule and I may see 15, 20 patients on the schedule and think, whoo, and I want to stay on time and I want to get done in time. And yet, if you think about that family that's coming to the Boster Center to see me, It's not one of 20 doctors they're gonna see that day. On the contrary, this is one of two or three visits that they may get for the entire year. To them, it's not one of 20 people. To them, it's a really, really big deal. And dare I rush that visit, that's not okay. I have to be respectful of the fact that they are coming to me with a major problem and I am here to try to help them with that major problem and we need to give them time. The reality is that there is so much pressure on physicians, on clinicians, to move quickly, to see more patients, to do more in less time, that sometimes we find ourselves participating in therapeutic inertia. So what is to be done? How do we combat therapeutic inertia? Well, number one, I want you to identify it. So when you start your day tomorrow, if you see therapeutic inertia, I want you to call it out. If you are someone impacted by MS and you find yourself holding back information from your clinician, I want you to consider, is that really the best thing to manage my MS? If you are involved in healthcare and you run up against a systemic step at it, write a letter of appeal, do a phone call with a peer-to-peer. And if you are a clinician taking care of families impacted by MS, I want you to check yourself and I want you to ask yourself, am I doing the right thing for that patient or am I trying to rush through the visit? My name's Aaron Boster and as always, thank you for learning about MS with me. I apologize for today's rant, but I really needed to get it off my chest. And I would be very curious what you guys think. Kindly leave your comments in the section down below. I look forward to reading them. And until my next Monday morning video or my next monthly live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.